In part one, we saw how Jakob Grimminger took part in World War I and returned to a war-torn Germany to be one of the first people to join the Nazi party. He took part in street fights in Munich and was one of those early Nazis that participated in the so-called March on Coburg. In November 1923, he took part in the Hitler Putsch in Munich. One of the swastika flags was carried by Heinrich Trambauer. When the shooting started, the flag fell and a Nazi, probably Andreas Bauriedl, fell on top of it, mortally wounded and bled out on it. Heinrich Trambauer rescued this bloody flag and when the Nazi party was refounded in 1925, it was presented to Hitler. Trambauer became the guardian of the flag and Jakob Grimminger his assistant. The flag became the very centre of the cult of Nazism, the holiest of the holies. It was the flag that was used to consecrate all Nazi party flags, including those of the SA, at a formal ceremony when new flags touched the blood flag. When Trambauer left Munich to get a job in Brandenburg, Grimminger took his place. From then on, he was wherever the flag was and followed Hitler around Germany when it was on show. And thus he became one of the best-known faces in the Third Reich, even if he hardly spoke. In 1933, the Nazis were propelled into power by conservative politicians who thought that they could control them. As it happened, it was Hitler who controlled those conservative politicians and thus largely, through violence, was able to seize power. The Nuremberg rally of the 30th of August the 3rd of September 1933 was the first rally following the Nazi seizure of power. There had been a number of rallies previously. The first rally was held in Munich in 1923 and the second in Weimar in 1926. The first rally to be held in Nuremberg was on the 19th the 21st of August 1927. The 1928 version was cancelled due to a lack of cash. An event went ahead from the 1st to the 4th of August 1929, but there was so much trouble with fighting that the Nuremberg city authorities banned it in the two subsequent years. By the summer of 1932, the Nazi party was the biggest party in Parliament, but it did not have the resources to put on the event, so it had to be cancelled. However, now in power and thanks to the German taxpayer, money was no object, the 1933 event was able to progress. Leni Riefenstahl made a film for the event. It was called Der Sieg des Glaubens, The Victory of Faith. Part of that faith was faith in the Führer and the cult objects around him, the holiest of holy being the blood flag, which was held by an immobile Grimminger, as can be seen in these excerpts from the Victory of Faith film. Of course, Particular importance around this cult was the consecration ceremony which consisted of touching the new flags with the blood flag. The 65 minute Leni Riefenstahl film of the event is not shown in chronological order but rather in an order which increases dramatic effect and, I would argue, to be centred upon the object of veneration which was Hitler. We can also see in the film a character who wasn't the last much longer. Head of the SA, Ernst Röhm, but for Röhm it was to be his last rally as Hitler would have him murdered the following June. Here we can see a couple of photographs on that day. In the first we can see Grimminger with Hitler and Röhm. For Röhm it was to be his last rally as Hitler would have him murdered the following June. A little later on that day we can see Hitler consecrating the standards whilst Grimminger is holding the flag behind him. The consecration ceremony consisted of touching the new flags with the blood flag. The 9th of November 1933 was the 10th anniversary of the attempted coup. Here we can see Nazis in the streets, some braving the cold, wearing the brown shirts for all to see despite the weather. Grimminger was allowed to keep his jacket on and someone else was holding the flag for him. Later that day he accompanied Hitler to where Hitler was awarded honorary citizenship of the city. Also in this photograph we can see notable Nazi old fighters. 
Franz Xaver Schwarz, Christian Weber, Ulrich Graf and Karl Fehler. After the National Social Seizure of Power, Gumminger received a job at the Welfare Office of the City of Munich, even though he had no background or experience in such matters. This is the way that he was rewarded for his Nazi Party service, by giving him a good job with a good salary. A few years later, he also became an honorary councillor in the Bavarian capital. The 34 Nuremberg rally was held from the 5th to the 10th of September. Around 700,000 people attended. It's probably the best known of all the Nuremberg rallies because of the Leni Riefenstahl film The Triumph of the Will which gave the rally its later name, The Rally of Will. Other names suggested included the Rally of Unity and Strength and the Rally of Power. It was also notable for Albert Speer's idea of the Cathedral of Light when anti-aircraft searchlights were used to create vast beams into the sky which symbolised the walls of the building. That year the Nazis went to a great effort in the stage management which was improved upon further in future events. On the 9th of September 1934 Grimminger was there with Hitler for the flag consecration ceremony. This is probably what Grimminger is best remembered for.
on the 9th of November 1934. As always, he was in Munich, although this time he was marching with his jacket off, like the others. On the 4th of July 1936, Grimminger was with Hitler and Robert Ley in Weimar. Hitler and Ley were here to break ground on the Gau Forum. During the Third Reich, this was known as Adolf Hitler Platz, under the East Germans as the Karl Marx Platz. This was meant to be an administrative centre for the party and its organisations, including the SS and SD. Due to bad project management, like many such complexes in the Third Reich, it was never finished. Although part of it was built. I've seen it, in my opinion, it's an ugly building, but of course there's no accounting for taste. On the 1st of August 1936, Grimminger married Hildegard Weber. For the time, he was quite old to get married. He was now 44. Around this time, despite not having a university education, he was able to join the Nazi Palaio Germania Former Students Association. The NSDAP had been formed from the German Workers' Party in February 1920, and Grimminger was behind Hitler for his speech at the Bürgerbräu Keller on the 24th of February 1937. As on every year, Grimminger was with Hitler for the consecration of the flags and the parades in Nuremberg in 1938. The 10th Party Congress was named the Rally of Great Germany. This was due to the annexation of Austria to Germany, which had taken place earlier that year. The rally was held from the 5th to 12th of September 1938. This was the largest rally of all. 1.3 million people visited and at times one train was arriving in Nuremberg station every 80 seconds. The photograph shown here dates the penultimate day, the 11th of September 1938. However, this was to be the last rally. The 1939 rally, called the Rally of Peace, was cancelled. The rally of peace was cancelled because the Nazis had started a war. November 1938 marked the 15th anniversary of the attempted coup by the Nazis to seize power. As always, this was the most special day in the Nazi calendar. It was celebrated in Munich and the blood flag was a major part of the cult for the day. Jakob Grimmingen was in the Munich Beer Hall for this event. It was also the date of the night of the broken glass and I believe that Grimminger was one of the criminals involved in the attacks on the Jewish community in the Bavarian capital. Most of the evidence for this comes from the diary of Joseph Goebbels, but at the same time it needs to be pointed out that much of the evidence is also circumstantial. If Grimminger were brought to court and accused of this, he would probably get away with it. However, I'm going to present the case and then you can make your own minds up. On the evening of the 9th of November 1938, Goebbels delivered a vicious anti-Semitic speech at the town hall in Munich which led to attacks against Jewish houses of worship. This came about following the death in Paris of German legation secretary Ernst von Rath who had been shot by the 17-year-old Herschel Grinspan in response to the plight of his parents who had been expelled from Germany but not admitted into Poland. Indeed, the first attacks had taken place in Magdeburg on the 7th of November 1938, organised by the local Nazi party there. Further disturbances had happened in Hesse during the day of the 9th of November 1938. Goebbels noted in his diary, The synagogues are being burnt down. If only one could now release the people's anger from its leash. This clearly shows that no centrally controlled action had been started, only local Nazi party initiatives, but Goebbels hoped to be able to initiate pogroms on a much larger scale. Goebbels had wanted to launch a pogrom after the murder of Wilhelm Gustloff, the Nazi party regional leader in Switzerland on the 4th of February 1936 by the Jewish student David Frankfurter. However, this coincided with the Olympic Winter Games in Garmisch-Partenkirchen in which the Nazi regime wanted to use positive self-portrayal towards sceptical foreign countries. Then, in order to prevent anti-Jewish pogroms by particular zealous National Socialists, the deputy leader Rudolf Hess issued the order that Individual actions against Jews on the occasion of the murder of the head of the Swiss regional group of the NSDAP must absolutely be avoided. In November 1938, the Nazis had more time to plan as von Rath lay dying. Goebbels wanted a pogrom through the entire country. Goebbels was with Hitler and other Nazi notables in the Hitler's favourite cafe in Munich, the Heck until 3 in the morning of the 9th of November 1938. 
Goebbels wrote in his diary, we discussed all possible questions. When Hitler learned that von Rath had been shot, he sent his personal physician Karl Brandt and Brandt's former professor Georg Magnus to Paris. I'll deal with this in more detail in another video, but it appears that Brandt may have deliberately botched the job so that von Rath, whom initially made a recovery, then died. Indeed, Dr. George M. Weish of the Universities of New South Wales in Sydney and New England in Armadale, Australia, goes as far as to say that what Brandt did next was nothing short of medical malpractice. Many years later, at his trial, Brandt said that the will of the people's community needs to take precedence over the needs of the individual, although he was not specifically referring to the death of von Rath. It would seem that Brandt or Magnus contacted Hitler to say that the patient had tuberculosis and Hitler ordered this to be hushed up. Hitler did not know von Rath and there was absolutely no need to send his personal doctor, or at least there wasn't if saving his life was the objective. If the objective, on the other hand, was to make sure that he died, then that made sense. And this fits in with what happened next. Hitler wanted a pogrom and he had a trusted band of followers around him, men who had been with him since the old days, since before the attempted putsch, who would ensure that his wishes were carried out. Von Rath died at around 1630 and Hitler would have learned about it from Brandt by telephone almost immediately. That year, the annual Nazi party meeting to commemorate the Hitler Putsch of 1923 took place at 1819, whilst a visit to Munich City Hall was planned for 20 hundred hours. Earlier, Otto Dietrich, Goebbels and Hitler had met before the memorial service in Hitler's apartment. What they discussed we do not know. They may or may not have driven to the rally together, although it's likely that Goebbels went alone and met Hitler in the town hall, which would explain why the Führer had an extraordinarily insistent conversation with Goebbels during this meal. Goebbels presented the matter to the Führer and thus informed him about the death of the diplomat and about the expansion of the anti-Jewish riots on the afternoon of the 9th of November in the Magdeburg region. Large demonstrations against the Jews had taken place and he further noted synagogues were set on fire and shops were demolished. Goebbels wrote about this conversation with Hitler at the meeting and I quote He decides, let the demonstrations continue, withdraw the police, the Jews should feel the wrath of the people this day. Goebbels agreed and immediately gave appropriate instructions to the police and the party. The pogrom started and progress was reported to the Nazi leadership. The more calls came in about the destruction of Jewish shops and synagogues, including those from other cities in the Reich, the more agitated and angry Hitler became. Adjutant von Bela wrote in his memoirs about Hitler's reaction on the night of the pogrom. However, von Bela does not explain why Hitler was angry. Was he angry about the destruction of Jewish property? Was he angry at the Jews? Von Bela was also implicated after the war for his role and therefore he would have been at pains to promote Hitler's innocence. Goebbels made his report to Hitler the next day and wrote about it in his diary. In the Osteria restaurant, I report to the Führer. He agrees with everything. His views are completely radical and aggressive. The event itself went perfectly, 17 dead, but no German property damaged. They are Goebbels' words. We know that that is actually not the case. Goebbels also reported that Hitler wanted to take strict measures against the Jews and to expropriate Jewish businesses. Goebbels furthermore noted that he'd ordered that 20 to 30,000 Jews be arrested immediately. This target was more than fulfilled. On the night of the pogrom and on the following days, 30,756 Jews were imprisoned and around 1,000 of them taken to Buchenwald, Dachau and Sachsenhausen concentration camps. The first death was reported to him around 2 in the morning, Heimbott, a Munich Jew of Polish nationality. As we've seen, the Adolf Hitler shock troop had been Hitler's bodyguard in the lead up to the attempted putsch. However, it had been banned after it and not reformed. Goebbels mentions it four times in his diary entries relating to the pogrom. Goebbels writes that Julius Schaub's old shock troops had woken up. 
Alongside other members of the Stoffstrup Adolf Hitler, they would meet for reunions, at least on the occasion of the celebration of the 8th and 9th of November. They also appear to have taken days out to the fortress at Landsberg, where some of them were held in prison, even to faraway Stettin. They had an informal group initially under the SA leadership. Later, after the quashing of the SA in June 1934, they came under the control of Friedrich Geiselbrecht in the office for the 8th and 9th of November, a department set up to handle the affairs related to the celebrations of the anniversary of the attempted coup. As for the members of the Stoßtrupp Adolf Hitler, they had certain things to do on this day. They would have certain honorary tasks such as creating the blood order bearers and handing out free tickets for public transport and meal passes, ID cards, service uniforms and the like. They were organisers. They would deal with who got into the evening event on the 8th of November in the Burgerbräu Keller as well as the formation of the marching block for the blood order bearers on the morning of the 9th of November. The shock troopers were always the guest of honour at the meeting at the Burgerbräu Keller. The seating arrangements for the comradeship evening on the 9th of November 1938 shows that in 39 of the approximately 400 participants were from the Soss troop Adolf Hitler. They were all seated near Hitler. As blood order bearers, the shock troop men had their own uniform, which had the additional Stoss troop armband and special cap. The shock troopers were therefore clearly identifiable and their unit was also mentioned in the contemporary press. The pogrom began in Munich sometime around 2230. It was probably started by those former members of Hitler's shock troop Goebbels wrote about in his diary. Hitler's shock troop is about to leave to clean up Munich. That's what happens right away. A synagogue is smashed up. I've tried unsuccessfully to save it from the fire. A number of Jewish shops near the old town hall were destroyed, so it can be assumed that the Stostrup and other participants met somewhere around there, probably after taking off their uniforms. Why did Goebbels state that he could not prevent the burning of the Ohel Synagogue and Herzog Rudolfstrasse? Logic states that he might have suggested this to the rioters, but they were taking orders from someone else. Goebbels had initially only given his Berlin district propaganda leader the order to have the synagogue on Fassenenstrasse smashed up. In Berlin he was giving the orders. In Munich he wasn't. After his speech, Goebbels went to the Gau headquarters on Prannenstrasse with Gauleiter Adolf Wagner and in this way seems to have become an eyewitness to the pogroms carried out by the shock troop. Meanwhile, the shock troop is doing its work and is doing a great job. He wrote. When Goebbels was on his way to the Four Seasons Hotel after the swearing in of the SS Verflugenstruppen and SS Totenkopf Verbandes, which took place at midnight at the Feldhellenhalle, he saw the synagogue behind it burning and wrote about in his diary. The synagogue is burning straight to the Gau. Nobody there knows anything yet. We just leave it, destroy as much as is necessary without damaging the surrounding buildings, otherwise let it burn down. The raiding party does terrible work. I think not only does point to the person who gave the orders, who would be not the local Gauleiter Adolf Wagner whom Goebbels accused of getting cold feet, but rather the old guard around Hitler who had set the pogrom off and logically the orders for this could only have come from one person. Grimminger had been part of the Stostrup Adolf Hitler, and whereas there's no proof that he participated in the violence, it would be highly unlikely if he didn't. Could the old boys from the Stostrup Adolf Hitler have started the pogrom off on their own? This is unlikely. On the 29th of May 1938, there'd been a Gauk party conference in Dessau. Hitler had criticised the participation of the Hitler Youth in the march, whereupon Schaub had the columns of the Nazi Youth Associations turned away without instructions or consultation. Hitler then became extremely angry and demoted his personal adjutant from SS Group Leader to SS Brigade Leader because of his high-handedness. This upset Schaub so much that Goebbels reported that he was completely broken and in tears. I know that for many years it has been presented that Hitler knew nothing of the pogrom and um, it's been blamed on Goebbels. I think, however, that the studies based on Goebbels' own diary do clearly implicate Hitler as being the person who gave the order to start all this off.
Das Kleine Volksblatt of Thursday the 9th of November 1939 carried an article on Grimminger, which you can see here. It was almost the last day of his life. This poster advertises the event to celebrate the 16th anniversary of the attempted putsch. The Führer Speaks proclaims the poster and speak he did with Grimminger standing behind him. Although due to the war there was no march to Feld Herrenhalle, although the wreath laying ceremony continued until the very end in 1944. The large swastika flag hides the pillar behind them and within that there was a bomb planted by Georg Elsner. The bomb was ticking away. Unfortunately, Hitler chose to leave early because of bad weather, meaning neither he nor Grimminger was there when it went off. The 24th of February 1940 was the 20th anniversary of the founding of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Hitler made a speech for the event and Grimminger, as always, was standing behind him with the flag. We can see a large commemorative sign has been placed on the wall to mark the location where the party was founded. The 20th anniversary of the coup was a much more subdued affair. Defeat was staring Nazi Germany in the face. Cities across the Reich were being pounded. Mussolini had been deposed and in the east the Red Army was getting close to the former border between it and Poland. In feierlichen Staatsakten nahm das deutsche Volk Abschied von zwei hervorragenden Persönlichkeiten. In München bei der Trauerfeier für Gauleiter Adolf Wagner in Anwesenheit des Führers. Die Trauerparade. Wagner was the former Gauleiter of Munich. He died on the 12th of April 1944. Hitler arrived for the funeral, which was given a lot of publicity in the press at the time. Hitler made a speech in the Deutsches Museum and the flag was brought out. Some say for the last time, but I don't think that was the case. To the best of my knowledge, and I could be wrong, it was used for a swearing-in ceremony for the Volkstum on October the 18th, 1944, in the presence of Heinrich Himmler, Wilhelm Keitel, Heinz Guderian, Heinz Heinrich Lammers, and Martin Bormann. And I think it was used for the last time on the 12th of November, 1944, in Munich, for the ceremony of the laying of the wreaths for those killed on the 9th of November, 1923. The event no longer had an all-star cast, but those that made it included Wilhelm Keitel, Franz Xaver Schwarz, Max Amann, Robert Ley, Wilhelm Frick and Bernard Rust. It is therefore reasonable to assume that the flag was then brought back to the Brown House in Munich. On the 7th of January 1945, the United States Army Air Force was in Munich and just to be friendly, they popped by the Brown House. They left in a terrible state. The blood flag was never seen again. I think the flag might have been removed after the bombing raid, but I have no idea where it went. Of course, it could have gone up in flames like most of the rest of the building. However, I find it a bit strange that a postage stamp would commemorate it only three months later if it had been destroyed. It might later have been looted and now be somewhere in the US or Germany or indeed somewhere else, such as somebody's camper van somewhere. However, Grimmingen was in Munich and one thinks that he might have known something about it. After the end of World War II, Grimminger, as a former member of the SS, was interned. 
He was brought before an Allied court for his membership in the SS. Although he was not sentenced to prison, the Allies confiscated all of his assets in 1947. When he was released for internment, he returned to Munich. On Saturday the 3rd of September 1949, the Vorarlberger Vortus Board had reported that a Munich court had classified Grimminger as a minor offender. It seems as though he attempted to get back into local politics, but the Germany of the post-war period was not interested in the ghost of the past which had destroyed the country. Strangely enough, there was next no interest in him after the war. There were few who had been so close to Hitler for so many years, but it is as though he had been condemned to be forgotten. He had little money and managed as best he could. He died on the 20th of January 1969. Gröninger was buried in the Munich Forest Cemetery, but after a while he was disinterred, presumably because his family didn't want or couldn't pay the rent. His remains were buried in an anonymous grave in the municipality of herzebrock klarhort in North Rhine-Westphalia, a region with which he had little contact. A book was published on him in 2011 by Winkelried Verlag as De Kornet der Blutfahne, die Präviden Aufzeichnungen von Jakob Grimminger. It was brought out again in, in 2012 as De Kornet der Blutfahne de Einerinigen von Jakob Grimminger, which I would translate as the Officer of the Blood Flag, the Private Notes of Jakob Grimminger, and for the 2012 version, the Officer of the Blood Flag, the Memories of Jakob Grimminger. With somebody who is so linked to the Blood Flag, the stories of the two are joined together. It's strange, however, that there was so little interest in him after the war, like with many other people, but I think the reason this can be explained. Germany wanted to forget the ghosts of Nazism. I hope you found that interesting. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours my time. I'm based in Poland and Germany, so if you're living somewhere else, it's going to be at a different time, possibly. My specializations in the Third Reich, in particular the Holocaust, and uh, so if you're interested in that type of thing, then you may want to subscribe. And um, But for the moment, thanks for listening.